Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live. I'm Joe Lynch. I am so pleased to be joined once again on September 24th, 2020 by State Representative Denise Provo from the 27th Middlesex District and Representative Mike Connolly from the 26th Representative District. To both of you, Denise Provo, how are you? It's been a while since we've seen you. I, I've been here mostly at the same computer, almost without interruption. Thank you, sir. I was going to tease you about your grand tour of Europe, but uh, I, I don't think that would play well for those who don't get my humor. So, M Mike Conley, I, I teased you about a two-month break in Puerto Vallarta, but you told me the farthest you've gotten to water is a walk along the river in Cambridge. Yeah, and it's it's a beautiful walk, you know. I would... Uh... I would pay money to do it, but I don't have to. Yeah, there you go. Um, I want to dive right into it. Um, we, we did, I, I never like, I like losing sight of the fact that we are still in a pandemic. And unfortunately for this country, we passed the dreaded milestone of 200,000 people um, who have succumbed to COVID in one way or another. Um, from the State House view, Denise, I'd like to start with you in terms of any updates we have in a general sense about COVID? About the infection itself? Um, you know, it's, the numbers have been ticking up a little and in some communities more than others. But, you know, over last weekend and two days, there were 900 new cases. Our deaths are over 9,100. We have about the same number, have had in Massachusetts, about the same number of deaths as all of Canada, to put it into perspective. So, you know, there's a lot of happy talk about how the positivity rate has gone down. Um, but I think that's largely a function of who gets tested. Um, there are a lot of folks who have been able to work from home and are getting tested for social reasons, whether it's to travel out of state or, you know, one of my daughter's friends went to a party, a big party um, that had as a requirement for attending that you have a negative COVID test result. So I think people who don't particularly need a fresh COVID test, um, are pushing up the numbers of healthy people getting tested, and that tends to keep the positivity rate low. Um, but, you know, I, I think we, we all need to be very careful as we head back indoors and as, you know, more and more people from out of state come into Massachusetts. Agreed. It is tricky, you know, when you try to navigate the dashboards that are put out by uh, this, the, the country, you know, if I, whether it's uh, John Hopkins or NIH or anybody else, and then you look at the Massachusetts dashboard and you look at the Somerville dashboard, one thing that does concern me is the number of deaths uh, that have ticked up in Somerville. Mm -hmm. I believe we are now up to uh, 42 or 43 deaths, which is, I don't want to use the word alarming, but it is concerning when you start looking at where we were a month ago and it's increased by that amount. So um, Mike, your comments, anything you wanna add in terms of what's happening in Cambridge? I noticed that the number of fatalities in Cambridge has held steady for over a month. Yeah, that's true. And you know, I definitely uh, appreciate, you know, everything uh, Rep Provo said and, and your perspective on it, you know, uh, we can't minimize the um, the the risk that remains. You know, if if on a daily basis we're seeing 400 new cases, 500 new cases, 300 new cases across the state, um, and when you look to Europe, they have had you know several countries have experienced uh, or are experiencing second waves of this pandemic. So I think vigilance and, and caution. Uh, continue to be n necessary. Yeah, um, you know, I'll toot my own horn. I always use that tagline, stay informed. You know, if, if, as the, if the general populace is becoming complacent, um, we have a problem with that. 
So be vigilant. Denise, I'd like to go back over to you for one moment. Um, the work at the State House continues virtually. Um, you want to update us on some of the legislative stuff you've been working on? Uh, sure. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of of effort going on now since we extended the session beyond what would have been its ending date of the 31st of July to get bills out of committee and, and voted on. We're going to have to have a budget by the end of October. We've been getting by on one twelfth budgets month by month, but those are one twelfth of last fiscal year's budget when revenues were higher. So that's not sustainable. Um, and early in October, the Ways and Means folks are gonna be bringing in economists from all over the state, from the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston to try to get a better take on what revenues are going to be. But of course, the, the biggest uncertainty in revenue drivers is COVID itself. Understood, understood. I think most people, you know, if you relate it back to their own budget, um, what you were making last year in 2019, if all of a sudden you took a drastic cut in pay in 2020, you may be able to ride it out uh, in 2020, but 2021 could be disastrous. And I think that's what the state is facing um, and municipalities are facing that as well. Um, Mike, on your side, um, apart from revenue projections, I know that you were concentrating on a couple of things the last time we spoke. Sure. Um, you know, housing is uh, always uh, a concern for Somerville and, and, and for our, our work on Beacon Hill. And, uh, you know, we have currently been um, in a state of eviction moratorium and foreclosure moratorium, but things are now, I think, going to um, really reach a, a critical point. Just yesterday, Governor Baker indicated that he's intending to allow the eviction moratorium uh, to expire on October 17th. Uh, I was actually just on the phone with Senator Jalen right before we uh, jumped on this Zoom call uh, to, um, to talk about legislation she and I filed and, and Rep Provost and Rep Barber co-sponsored it to really extend housing stability for everyone who's been impacted either directly by the virus or indirectly due to economic fallout or you know, the need to care for family members. And uh, so we're still hopeful we can move um, a proposal forward in the next few weeks uh, another big element here is the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, they issued an order for the entire nation halting evictions for anyone impacted by COVID-19, either directly or indirectly. And they, you know, I think what's most significant is they really hammered home from a public health standpoint, from the scientific standpoint, the notion that anyone would be displaced during this pandemic is really not acceptable. And so uh, I will say, you know, as with anything that's in any way connected to Donald Trump's federal government, I don't think we can rely or depend on the CDC order. But what we're doing in our advocacy right now is taking that point that the CDC made that said, as a matter of policy, we don't want to see evictions for the rest of the year, and really stressing that point to leaders on Beacon Hill to say, you know, if the federal government CDC says they don't want evictions, can we now step up and do more? And then the final thing I'll say, of course, is yes, we have to stop evictions. We also have to help tenants and landlords um, undo or unwind whatever debts there are. Um, and so certainly our legislation looks to do that in a thoughtful way. Nobody should, you know, go bankrupt or face, you know, debt collection activities because they lost their job and struggled to pay with their rent. So we're working on that, but it remains a, a day in and day out effort. So, you know, it's a great conversation to have, and I want to include Rep Provo in this. Your thoughts about, so I understand, you know, the eviction moratorium. 
I understand why Baker is probably at the point where he needs to start unraveling that. I don't like it, but I understand why he's doing it. But once again, Mike and Denise, it comes down to the fact that the federal government is putting their hands in their pocket. They understand what the problem is, but they're putting their hands in the pocket and leaving it up to the state. Baker's looking at his pocketbook and saying, you know, I've got to start unraveling this thing, which then trickles down to the local municipalities to take care of the cleanup. So if we do a moratorium extension here in Somerville, right? I don't understand how that can work if the state is not on board with us or the federal government is not gonna help the landlords who own property. I mean, am I, am I confused about how the process would work? But it seems like there is a huge problem here if we lift that eviction moratorium and some out of state conglomerate who owns 15 apartment buildings in Cambridge or Somerville starts eviction notices against the people who can't pay their rent because they may be out of work. Rep Provo, you wanted to say something. I, I'm just going to be quiet for a minute, let you guys discuss. No, it, 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 you did a good job of framing the question. Um, but it, you know, the, the data collection that's gone on shows us that evictions have been going up. So, you know, saying there's a moratorium is one thing, but it doesn't always have a practical effect. Um, the other thing is that you've put your finger on the, the rank hypocrisy of the federal government creating an eviction moratorium without a funding bill to make sure that landlords don't end up in foreclosure because they can't meet their payments to the bank. Um, you know, just as, as, you know, tenants who don't have income could end up evicted and on the street in a public health emergency, you know, but, but, you know, the, the losses are real and the money needs to come from somewhere to help to make those whole. Now, the federal government has prioritized, you know, bailing out airlines and, um, you know, giving financial relief to a lot of very big companies. Um, but th the relief needs to, needs to really be targeted toward those who are suffering and toward the kind of losses that are going to worsen. Because you do point out it's going to be a multi-year recovery. Um, Boston Business Journal says that, that residential rents are falling in greater Boston for the first time in, I, I can't remember, they, they referred to some long ago year in which this last happened. But it's not a sustainable system unless folks in the, in the both sides of the relationship are getting financial help and, and counseling. You know, if, if um, the-, Look, the Denise, Denise, I'm sorry, let me go back to one thing before I lose my train sure. of thought. And your, your audio is good, but you're kind of breaking up on the video, but that's Am fine. I? We'll keep going. Um, so you mentioned about how the funding mechanism would work. And I'm interested, would, would we start seeing a pushback if the federal government says to the banks, okay, we want you to start forgiving some of these mortgage things. Mm -hmm. We're gonna fund you, the bank, directly and let you administer that program with your mortgagees. Do you think that's the safe way of doing it, or should it go directly to those who can prove hardship because of non-collection of rent? Whoa. Um, it's such a granular question for such a big policy. I would, I would hesitate to give a lot of money to the banks to grant this kind of relief unless there was going to be heavy-duty auditing. 
uh, to, you know, to make sure that, that they're doing it in appropriate circumstances to appropriate borrowers. Um, more likely or more, more reasonably, um, a, a requirement, some, some funding given, say, to HUD, and so a requirement that, that lenders and borrowers, mortgage lenders and borrowers, renegotiate terms, and then HUD would be in a position to, um, to even things out so that the losses don't fall completely on one side. Um, but we know who's head of HUD. Do you think that person has the capability to administer that kind of a program? Uh, the head, not so much. Probably some of the career people, assuming we still have career civil servants left in this country who know how to administer programs. Um, yeah, the the um, the heads are are not. The, you know, the big appointees are not necessarily inspiring, but gover federal government is, is very big. Right. Um, whether something like that could go on at the state level <coughs> is possible, but, you know, we did an economic stimulus bill, we in the legislature, that, that did not uh, prioritize that that kind of um, investment. Mike, I'm wondering, for, uh, thanks Denise, I'm wondering from, you know, the city of Cambridge has an enormous amount of, um, more than Somerville, I shouldn't say enormous, but you have a lot of out of state, multinational corporations that own property, um, whether it's hotels or big condo developments along the river. How do you administer something like that? to assist those holders of property, whether they're, you know, um, renter, whether they rent their properties or they have commercial properties that they rent, how do you assist them and at the same time give the money directly to the people most hurt? I mean, I guess I'm trying to ask a, a question about who gets priority here. Sure, it's a great question. And, and actually, in this legislation that, that Senator Jalen and I filed, the, the COVID-19 Housing Stability Act, we attempt, and, you know, and I think we, we do a good job of, frankly, creating a framework uh, that would address these questions on the state level. So certainly, if our, you know, if our state makes the decision to raise new revenue, and I think we in Somerville are supportive of that, or, and or if our federal government does a further relief package and sends us revenue, uh, the concept that we've put out there is that uh, there would be a uh, oversight committee representative of the communities most impacted by COVID-19 and the housing emergency, and they would provide guidelines for how we prioritize um, you know, relief on rents or, or back debt. And the concept of our bill is relief would be handed out to the landlord um, on a priority basis. So that means the quote unquote mom and pop landlord who has one or two units would be at the front of the line. Uh, the commercial landlord would be at the very back of the line. We don't necessarily, um, and I certainly don't necessarily think that we can guarantee uh, that every landlord, particularly those big corporate ones, gets everything. I think some people have to take a haircut. Um, but what we would say is to the extent we provide relief directly to the landlord, what comes with that is then canceling that rent due, owed by the tenant. And so that's one way to work it out. You certainly could set it up in the other direction where you hand money to the tenant and then they give it um, to the landlord. But, you know, there are ways to do this logically. I think the big issue right now is political will at the highest levels. You know, our, our delegation, we have the will, we're on the phone, we're working on it. But when you get to the highest levels of state government and federal government, you know, the, the urgent need for this kind of solution still hasn't um, sunk in, apparently.
And apparently, I mean, I, I want to go on to another subject, but apparently it's not going to get the attention that it needs during a very heated presidential debate. Um, I, I, you know, I just fear. I fear that, that that whole issue of housing stability, real estate prices, corporate involvement in owning property that they rent to people who don't own property, that may unravel very, very quickly because nobody in the federal government who is in power today is paying attention to it. Yeah, I, I, the final thing I'll add is, you know, addressing this issue proactively and aggressively, uh, it makes good sense financially, public health wise. If we have people getting evicted and then they're moving into crowded congregate settings, either with family members or shelters, and then we see a second wave of the virus, in the end, we're going to pay more dearly for not acting sooner uh, than otherwise. And so we have to act quickly and, and hopefully um, we will continue to make progress in the coming weeks. Agreed. Rep. Provo, I want to kind of pivot a little bit and go to the uh, small business owners. Um, anything on the state house level of assisting? Primarily, I think what's been in the news a lot and something that I pay attention to is the hospitality industry. Um, or a restaurant or our service workers have been, have been punched in the gut time and time again during the course of the pandemic. Any relief that we can see coming at the state level? Well, as you know, there's been an effort to cap delivery fees uh, for meals that are, that are taken out, not consumed on premises, which is going to get more important again, as the weather gets colder. Um, but the lobbyists for those companies are, are fighting tooth and nail not to have their fees reduced. Um, I, I know that Senator Jalen wants to come on to your show with some, um, some small business owners and talk about the day-to-day the difficulties of of trying to keep afloat something like a quarter of the state's restaurants have already closed permanently so i would encourage anyone who can to eat out or order in uh, when you can uh, if you know if you want to see the the places that you enjoy in your in your neighborhood in your community survive, um, because many many of them won't be able to. Um, in terms of direct relief, we were all looking to Congress for more of that. It appears that that that's not going to be happening. Um, so it's 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 going to be uh, it's go going to be a, a terrible reckoning, I think. Um, the The Baker administration is fiddling with the rules the way that they do, and you've probably seen the publicity that up to ten people can sit at a bar now but not drink. It, it's um, you know, it's, it's, it's the kind of uh, window dressing micromanaging that um, has characterized so much of the administration's response to the virus. I don't see how it can be particularly helpful um, um, unless unless people buy some of those masks that I've seen that have a little flap over a hole that you can put a straw through directly into your mouth, you know, cocktail masks. I, I'm looking into purchasing several dozen of those for myself, Representative Provo. You know that um, I wait for Friday afternoons now to open the refrigerator and see how many of those soldiers are waiting for me uh -huh. for the weekend. Um, I don't mean to make light of it, and, and I tend to agree being you know, somewhat involved in how our service industry operates here in the city. Um, and I'll say it again, you know, it is heartbreaking 
to watch some of these folks who have their life savings, their entire life into a smaller operation. It is heartbreaking to me to see that after all they've done, you know, six months into it, they realize the end might be near. Mm -hmm. And it just, I can see it on their faces. I can hear it in their voices when they're in front of me or when they call me. Um, the nibbling around the edges thing is interesting about how the governor is trying to assist. Um, I think these restaurateurs would much rather he come up with some kind of an economic boost mm -hmm. for them rather than nibbling around the edges and allowing you know four more people to sit at the bar and have a cocktail. I think what he's ignoring is that the general populace are still very uncomfortable about going into yeah. a restaurant um, they kind of like the outdoor seating, and I'm glad that he's extended that. And or mm -hmm. what he's basically said to the municipalities is, you know what? Beyond November 1st, you guys figure it out. Each each municipality is different. Figure it out. See which way you want to go on this. Um, it is the intention of Somerville um, to bring that up in a, a very cohesive, hopefully understanding way next week. Um, tonight, the city council will, here in Somerville will vote to cede that authority for all the outdoor uh, seating or anything else that's associated with it. They will cede that over to the licensing commission for the remainder of 2020 right through 2021. So um, it always makes it easier if you have um, folks who are almost concentrated on one part of the sector. Um, to, to try to figure out some things that we can do for them. But it's interesting from the governor's perspective that he's balancing the public health versus the economic health on a municipal by municipal basis. And that to me is disturbing. So just my, just my opinion. It is, and the other disturbing thing is how often the rules have changed and how often the administration has said to the municipalities, you figure it out and then put down rules. That's basically what we're being told at the municipal level. I'm getting the warning signal here that we got about 10 seconds left. Both well, of thanks you- thanks for having us. Both of you, I could spend hours just you know talking about it, trying to understand it, trying to come up with ways of assisting, but you know that both of you are welcome back anytime. And if you, you have a special show that you want to do other than Thursdays, please let us know. Okay. State Representative Denise Provost, State Representative Mike Conley, thank you, thank you so much for joining us on Somerville Media Center Live. For Thanks, the Media Joe. Center, for the Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. Stay safe, stay informed. See you next time.